audience of icons of families and children who were able to uh, sing with us and to celebrate that powerful and moving Sunday. Now, as we're getting now into rea reality, the meat of Great Lent, we're really going to start contemplating that self-reflection for all of us about prayer, about fasting, and almsgiving. And it's going to be especially blessed because this upcoming Sunday, which is one of my favorite Sundays, is the second Sunday of Great Lent, which we're going to talk about the great saint of our church, St. Gregory Palamas. So tonight, uh, John, Mr. John Anton, will speak about St. Gregory Palamas and Hezekasm. And just a little tidbit, and I'm not trying to, I will take anything from John, but the most important tidbit is that uh, St. Gregory Palamas was the Archbishop of Thessaloniki. If you've been to Thessaloniki, the Metropolitan now the metro Metropolitan Church is of St. Um, St. Gregory Palamas. They have his relics there. It is truly an inspiring um, view to come into that church, not only to be able to venerate the relics of St. Gregory Palamas, but actually more so to see the beauty of that cathedral. Who's actually been? Raise your hands. Uh, okay, we got about five or six of them. And we got a lot of Tripoliciotes and Nisiotes, so they're in their own worlds. But uh, Thessaloniki and Macedonia is a, it's a beautiful part of Greece. I think it's incredibly beautiful. But, the, but St. Gregory Palamas' cathedral in particular, it left me outside of Hagia Sophia and in, Constantinopoli, in Istanbul, and um, Ayo Dimitri in Thessaloniki. It was my third most moving experience going to a church because wall to wall is iconography. Every action and moment of Christ's ministry and life is depicted on iconography throughout the entire cathedral. And I remember seeing like the image of Christ speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well, all these other things. And so if you ever get a chance to really, you know, Thessaloniki is that queen city. It's that simultaneous Queen City with Constantinople. That's why that road, that ethnic although that goes through that part all the way through Europe, goes through downtown Thessaloniki. And it's a great blessing for us to uh, witness and to realize that they have incredible, incredible um, churches, monasteries, and the relics of the saints. St. Saint, Saint Gregory Palamas being one of them, St. Demetrius, the Vito Blitti, uh, St. Theodora, who is one of the patrons of Thessaloniki. They have a monastery literally downtown Thessaloniki. You think you're like in a hub. You think you're in a spiritual oasis in the middle of a bustling, enormous metropolitan city like Thessaloniki. Yeah, yeah Louis? Church of, uh, Saint Cyril yeah, Cyril Methodius, Kyrios and Methodius. Uh, that's a beautiful church as well, too. We visited that on our senior trip. Um, St. Philodoro, as I said, you guys go to the Anopoli, which is the upper city, and there's other remarkable churches, monasteries, and um, historic landmarks that really connect everything for us, not only as Greeks, but as Orthodox Christians. And so, when we're going to be hearing shortly from uh, Yanni, we're going to be really edified to understand a little bit more about St. Gregory Balamas, and how we can apply his teachings to our own day-to-day -day life. Um, I just want to introduce now Yanni before, as you can take a couple more bites, and then uh, we'll go from there. Did you take a couple bites? Okay. <laughs> um, a couple introductions for John. So, Mr. John Anton, as we had uh, said in uh, church, he is a graduate of our seminary, Hellenic College, Holy Cross, Greek Orthodox School of Theology. He uh, is a Chicago-born child of the Metropolitan of Chicago, grew up in the community of St. Haralabos and Niles. He graduated from the high school of Stevenson, which isn't too from here, and we have uh, some parishioners that attended as well. Uh, he himself then obviously found a type of calling to go to the seminary, but as you notice today during his chanting this evening, he has an incredible depth and beauty, not only for his South Simo, in other words, his chanting, uh, but also for both languages, Greek and English. So we were truly blessed and edified tonight to hear from him, and our entire chanters as well, too, who did such a beautiful job to... Uh, give glory to God and to allow us to worship together. And then John has now been assigned to the community of the Ascension of Our Lord in Lincolnshire, where he is working under the tutelage of Father Sotiri Malamis, and he has the pastoral system there. He not only helps him operate all the ministries, he's also one of the chanters, and then he also teaches visiting music at the Community of Ascension of Our Lord in Lincolnshire. He also taught visiting music at the Community of St. John the Baptist in Des Plaines and was the chanter there. And then he also was at Holy Apostles in Westchester. 
and he also taught chant, visiting chant there as well as chanted. He also was in, at Fanari camp for many years, and then he also became one of the lead directors, I think it was in 2021. And is there any other kudos I can give to a young man such as yourself? Yeah. Or Faiz, he's, he's an important dancer. My God, he puts all of us to shame. So uh, <laughs> I, I hope I could be even a step to him. Uh, but more importantly, he truly is a humble man, and we uh, we thank him. <coughs> we thank him for being here tonight. And more importantly, we pray that our Lord not only illumines him and strengthens him, but God willing will enhance his ministry as well too. That in the future he will be blessed with the Yeroshimi, the ordination of the priesthood, to serve all of our metropolis of Chicago in any way that our Lord calls. But we're blessed to have uh, Mr. John Anton, and let us welcome with a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you everybody for having me, um, and for giving me a break from Ascension. Um, I don't get away much. <laughs> it's always good to, you know, see other communities and get away and kind of, uh, you know, experience more of the metropolis. So it really is wonderful to be here. Thank you, Father, for inviting me. So I wanted to talk about St. Gregory Palamas tonight, um, because when I was growing up, I don't know about many of you, but when I was growing up, we always learned that the second Sunday of Great Lent was the Sunday of St. Gregory Palamas. And that's basically it. We wouldn't learn anything more than that. We knew the Sunday of Orthodoxy, we knew the Sunday of the Cross, the Ladder, St. Mary of Egypt, they were well-known stories. But St. Gregory Palamas was one of those kind of, it was one sentence really. You might know something about prayer about him, but personally, that's all I knew. So when I got to seminary, I was able to take actually a semester-long class on St. Gregory. I learned about his life and about his teachings and why he's such a big deal, why we dedicated a whole Sunday of Lent to his memory. And I was able to go to Thessaloniki that summer to um, visit his relics, and he's made a profound impact on me, and I wanted to share that with all of you as well. So, St. Gregory Palamas and Hezekiah. So, from the get-go, we need to understand what hesychasm is, or isichasmos in Greek. It comes from that Greek word isichia, which means not only just quiet, but also a sort of stillness. And the idea behind hesychasm is behind, it's about combining prayer and kind of a spiritual discipline and auspices, and in putting all of those things together, what you're trying to do is Focus your mind. We kind of get distracted in our modern day world. We have our mind on the next five minutes, the next ten minutes, on our phone, what we did five minutes ago, where we need to go, where we've been, all the things in our calendars. And you see, Cosmo, Hesychasm is about kind of bringing together our scattered minds, refocusing them, and focusing them particularly on Christ. We do this by watching what goes into our hearts and what comes out of our hearts. Some of the fathers actually describe it as having a watchtower, like a guard tower over our hearts, and making sure that there aren't any intruders coming in and kind of bothering our peace. And what we're trying to do there is we're trying to cleanse ourselves, trying to remove these thoughts that kind of war against us and shake us up so that Christ can enter, so that we can have that peace, that stillness, that isihia, that's more than just an external silence, it's more of an internal silence. You're driving up those motives me, those temptations that you might have. You do this by, first and foremost, by the Jesus Prayer. I think many of us might have Koposkinia here, we have our prayer robes. We say, Lord Jesus Christ, have your seven. So that's a big part of it. But it also includes kind of controlling our breathing a little bit. Kind of inhale, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on the sinner. And you do this repetitively, and it kind of calms you down, it helps you focus, kind of brings you back to yourself, in a sense. There's also some body postures that some of the fathers will prescribe, not like yoga, per se, but more of a, you know, the way the father is sitting here in the picture. You might be sitting kind of hunched over, and the idea behind that is you're bringing yourself literally closer to your heart, where we believe Christ resides. That's what you're trying to accomplish. In the end, though, it's not anything that we do that brings Christ to us. It's Christ who comes. It's 
Christ's grace, it's his own blessings that bless us. What we're doing, though, is we're inviting him and we're kind of cleansing ourselves so that he can be reflected in our own lives, so he can shine through us. This is not something that was invented by the fathers. Nobody kind of sat down one day and came up with this. Um, St. Gregory actually kind of cites the Theotokos as being the first hesychast in tradition. He says, she constructed a new and indescribable way of achieving heaven, which he calls the silence of the mind. So Theotokos, among many other of our leaders of our faith, was one of those people who kind of pioneered this idea of inner silence. You can also look to scripture. Um, when Christ is talking to his disciples, he tells them how to pray. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. One way the Hesychast kind of tradition understands this is not so much about a physical room, but going into the room of your heart, going into the room within you, and kind of closing the door to distractions and to everything outside of you. And just being with Christ and asking him to be with you and asking for his mercy. You're kind of descending in, you're being still, and you're praying. Hesychasm precedes St. Gregory, who we're going to talk about in a moment here, by about a thousand years. St. Gregory didn't come around until about the 1300s. But we have fathers talking about isikasmo and this practice of inner stillness all the way up until, here I've listed the 6th or 7th century, but even before that, we have fathers talking about, in the 3rd century, talking about um, quieting our hearts, focusing on Christ, and having this kind of inner stillness. For his part, St. John of the Latter, when he wrote his book, The Latter of the Divine Ascent, he dedicated the 27th step to the isichia of the body, the isichia of the soul. So even way before St. Gregory came along, the church knew about having this inner silence. And it continued long after St. Gregory. Um, only 200 years ago now, in about the 1800s, this book was published called the Philokania. And it's this collection, it's a wide collection, of the writings of various church fathers who talk about the various ways of quieting the soul, of bringing Christ into you and achieving this inner stillness. It's a bit of a difficult book to read, I'll give you that. I haven't read it myself, but it's kind of a treasure trove, an anthology of these writings of these church fathers. We also have contemporary saints, St. Joseph the Hesychast, other disciples of his who were kind of um, beacons of this way of monastic life in the 20th century. So St. Gregory. This is a very short biography because everything that comes after this slide kind of more clearly defines why the church holds him in such high regard. So he lived in about the 14th century. He was a monk on Manapos. He was ordained in the priesthood in the wonderful facility of Thessaloniki, which he really is wonderful. It's worth it. Um, he was a huge uh, advocate for hesychasm, and he eventually became the Archbishop of Thessaloniki for about nine years until he passed away. And then only nine years after that, he was canonized, which is very quick in Orthodox. Usually it takes decades. St. Baisius was an exception, took him 20 years. Other saints, decades, hundreds of years. Nine years is very fast. So the church knew he was a saint and was quick to canonize him. And his feast day outside of Lent is in November, right before the fast starts on November 14th. So, his opponent, Barlam of Calabria. Now I put this here as a joke, because <laughs> we in the Orthodox Church don't make icons of heretics. And Barlam, as you'll come and see in the next few slides here, was not very helpful to the growth of Orthodoxy, let's say. He was born in Italy, in a Greek community. He was a monastic, but he was very well educated, very well, very well read. And when he arrived on Athos, he noticed St. Gregory Palamas was this big practicer of hesychasm, of this inner stillness. And he asked the monks, what are you doing? Why are you all hunched over? Why are you saying your prayer rolls? You know, doing prostrations and all of that. And they kind of explained hesychasm to them. And he scoffed at them. He said, this is ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. 
And so he quickly became an opponent of this movement. He set out to humiliate St. Gregory and to try and turn over what he considered to be a huge detriment to the church. He actually gained a following of monks and even of lay people in his effort to do this. So what was he claiming? He was claiming, first of all, he condemned everything that Palamas was saying. He was saying, well, you're trying to know God through kind of your prayer and prostration, right? But we can't know God. God's unknowable. He's a mystery. So I don't know what you're trying to do here. You're wasting your time. He even called them navel gazers. <laughs> you're literally looking down and looking at your, you know, your navel. You're wasting your time, he was saying. He was saying the glory of God, which is revealed in Scripture in times like the Transfiguration. Remember, Christ went up on the mountain and he shone brighter than the sun. Metamorphos, we call it in Greek. And other instances like the burning bush with Moses, when Moses saw the burning bush glowing there. He said, there's no way that this is the uncreated light of God. Because we can't see God. Those two things don't work with each other. So, you're, you're confusing things, he would say. Because what you're doing here is you're splitting up God. Like there's an invisible God, there's a visible God. You're making things way too complicated. There's no way this is real orthodoxy, Barlam was saying. So Barlam said, forget all of this hesychasm. Book learning is the way to go. Get a formal education, read, get a degree, put away this whole prayer thing. And that's how you're going to come to know God. Learn. By book, by scholastic methods. In particular here, like I said, was the transfiguration. Like we said, Christ went up on the mountain, and it says he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. So really, kind of the question here that Barlaam was saying was, what exactly did the disciples see? Did they see God can you see God? Was that even possible? Can we see God at all? And that's kind of the fundamental question. Is We as Christians talk about uniting ourselves with God. That's kind of our end goal, right? We want to be sanctified. We want to become holy. We want to become saints. We want to be one with Christ. We say that a lot. And when Barlaam and Palamas were fighting, that was kind of the question of what does that mean exactly? How do you experience God? Are you kind of, are you united with him? Do you get dissolved into God? Is there a little man? Is there like two cans and a you know, rope between? And what is it? How does that work? And this issue actually came up, like I said, about a thousand years before then. And it was unresolved up until the time of St. Gregory. And then it became the forefront issue of the church. So Balamas got all these angry letters from Barlaam. Barlaam was kind of creating a whole ruckus. And Palamas said, we need to do something about this. So he wrote this work called The Triads. Very extensive work, very dense theology, very long. Can't say I've read it, only snippets. And what he says in this is a very logical but orthodox way of understanding both God and a way of understanding how we experience God. He says, yeah, you can do book learning. That's not bad. You can, you know, you can read about God. You can read about, you know, the writing of the Bible. It's all good. But eventually, if you're going to come to know God, you have to move past books. You have to experience him shining in your heart. You have to experience him from within your soul. You're not going to experience him in a book. How can the wisdom of the flesh, of our bodies, of our minds, produce the image and likeness of God in the soul? That's what St. Gregory Balamas said. Book learning, he said, is not going to get you there. So don't get too caught up. Use it as a launching point, but don't get too caught up in it. He says that victory over our passions, over these things that are tying us down, leads us to receiving that kind of illumination, that divine light from and to ultimately seeing God. So when Moses' face shines after he sees God, it's not because, you know, he read a book or because he got some secret knowledge of God. No, no it's not going to happen like that. It's because his mind's been purified. God has shined in his heart. And that's something that we're aiming for too, even today. We're looking for Christ to shine in our hearts as well. 
We can see God, but he does remain unknowable <coughs> and transcendent. You're never going to fully understand God. That's why this knowledge that we're talking about is kind of limited. So we can experience God through our senses, but it's, it's more than what we see. It's more than what we smell. It's more than what we hear, perhaps. Kind of a long quote, but I'll pick out a few parts. St. Gregory says, Not only are man's knowledge of God and his understanding of himself and his proper rank a more lofty knowledge than natural sciences, but he says, our mind's knowledge of its own weaknesses <coughs> and the search for our healing is incomparably superior by far. For the mind that realizes its own weakness has discovered whence it might enter upon salvation and draw near to the knowledge and receive light of knowledge and receive true wisdom. So he's saying, we're not looking for earthly knowledge. We're looking for knowledge of ourselves. We're looking for what's lacking within us so that we can have our own salvation, so that we can grow in wisdom towards Christ. That's the greater knowledge. That's the greater wisdom that we can have. And then he goes on to make this very, very important distinction, which is, it's a little dense. Took me a long time to understand it, and I don't know if I even fully understand it myself, but I'll, we'll do our best here. So he talks about essence and he talks about energies. So he says God has an essence and he says God has energies. God's essence is the thing that makes God him, or the thing that makes me me. It's his usia. Okay? It's the thing that's like, you know, it's what makes God God. God's essence is something completely separate from us. We can't touch it. It's not like we're missing out on anything, though. Because that's what makes God, God. Okay? That's what makes us, us. It's two separate things. Then there's God's energies. It's the way that God acts. The way that God kind of manifests himself. The things he does and the ways he presents himself to us. Any experience that we have of God is of God's energies, his love, his mercy, all of creation, his grace. So God has an essence, and it's kind of self-contained, and then God has energies. One way, good way to think of this is like the sun. There's the sun, and then there's heat, and there is light. When you see the sun, and you're kind of participating in the sun, so to speak, you're not becoming one with the sun, right? You would burn up and die. That's not very good. What you're experiencing is the heat. You're experiencing the light of the sun. And so, in that sense, you're kind of experiencing the sun like that. Now, this isn't a great analogy. There's no kind of perfect way to express this. Another way to kind of experience it would be magnets. There's the magnet, and then there's kind of the magnetic field, right? So, paper clips get attracted to the magnet, right? And so now they're kind of, they're up on each other. But there's kind of the essence of the magnet, there's the essence of the paperclip. And even if they're next to each other and they're tied together, there's still a magnet and it's still a paperclip, right? So when we experience God, we're not becoming God. We're not becoming, we're not getting dissolved into God, right? God remains God, we remain us, but we are united. That's how St. Gregory kind of explains it. So we don't experience his essence, we experience his energies. And that's how we get united with him. That's how we can be united with him forever. And so Barlam hears all this, and it's complicated. And he says, wait a minute, so we're missing out on something? So God's holding back on us? But Barlam says, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. God's essence makes him him, and he makes us us, okay? You're experiencing everything God has to offer. You're experiencing the fullness of God in his energies. Because you're going to continue being you, and God's going to continue being him. Okay? That's how we become blessed. That's how we become sanctified. And God is fully present in his energies. It's not part of God. It's not secondary to him. It's not some, you know, minor created thing. You're not missing out on anything. That's just how it is. That's how we approach God. That's how he expresses himself to us. Barlam doesn't like this. 
And so they face off. And there's basically a trial, almost. They meet in Hagia Sophia in Constantinople in 1341 in this big city. The emperor is there, the patriarch is there, bishops are there, judges are there, all the lay people are there. It's jam-packed, and they get up, and they express their points before everybody. Palamas makes his points, Barlaam makes his points, and the emperor makes the decision. And he gives it before the people. And Barlaam is condemned. And they say, you were espousing heresy. You can come to know God. Because the apostles saw him, the transfiguration, and the hesitants know what they're talking about. Palamas knows what he's talking about. This is the correct way. This is orthodoxy. So Barlaam gives up. He says, I can fight this, but it's not worth it. Gives up. He leaves for Italy. He actually becomes Catholic. And his writings are completely destroyed. Any evidence we have of him is only from Palamas' writings against him. But his ideas kind of carry on. And this man named Takindinos comes along, and I'll kind of breeze through this here because it really does go on for a while. Takindinos later kind of adopts his idea, and he continues to attack the Hesychast for about two months. And then they meet again, and they kick him out, and then another person comes along. They have to keep fighting this for 10 more years until finally, after politics and excommunications and invasions, it's quite the story, honestly. Palamas finally prevails and the Hesychasts are declared the true Orthodox way. They would have kind of established this earlier, but the emperor died right after the First Council and he was like Palamas' best friend here, so it took a little bit longer than it should have. Um, in the end, St. Gregory became Archbishop of Thessaloniki in 1359. He died for nine years later, and then they canonized him very quickly. And St. Second Sunday of Lent was only then dedicated to his memory. So, <coughs> having said all this, why is any of this important? Why is St. Gregory such a big deal? Well, because St. Gregory, through his chasm, he teaches us that God doesn't hold back on us. He fully reveals himself to us. When we look at this icon of the transfiguration, when we say that Christ transfigured himself, he didn't show us, a sh he didn't make a show. He didn't show us anything secondary. He didn't create something for us to see. He showed us the truth of who he is fully for us to behold, as the scriptures say, as much as we can bear. That is the uncreated life. It's not his Lucia, because we can't be like Jesus. But it is the fullness of God. It is his uncreated life. And that is truly astonishing that God reveals himself to us. We say it every morning in Orphans. God is the Lord that has revealed himself to us. And that's what we have Great Lent for. Great Lent is a time for us not to feel distant from God, but to draw near to him time to seek him out every morning and every night and every moment of the day. It's a call to experience God fully, especially during Great Lent. It's a time for us to draw near to him, to be united with him, to behold his glory, for him to take us by the hand and to lead us to life. And we do that through the examples of so many saints across the century. Most recently we have for example, St. Joseph the Hesychast, who lived on Mount Athos, and he's called the Hesychast because he's so, so strictly held to this Hesychast tradition. I'll leave you with, well, this, and then some pictures of him. St. Ephraim of Katunaika, who's only very recently canonized, he said, I'll read the whole thing, it's actually worth reading. Set aside half an hour out of the 24. Half an hour is kind of a lot, but it's, that's a goal to reach through. And say the Jesus prayer, whenever you're able, the evening is the best, say it without using a prayer rope. If you need to use a prayer rope, that's okay. But basically, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on you. If you cultivate this, he says, you'll see what fruit it brings. From half an hour, it'll become an hour, and you need to guard this hour. Whether the phone is ringing, you have a task you need to do, or you're sleepy, or something is coming before you to bother you, turn off the phone, finish your do this half hour. 
and you'll see, he says. You've planted a little tree, and tomorrow or the day after, it will bear fruit. St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil, both began like this and became luminaries for the whole world. St. Simeon, the new theologian, had experiences of the uncreated light while he was still a layman, just like any of us. So this is not something too high for us. This is not something for monastics. This is not something of ancient past. This is something for us today. This is something we can all do. We can all begin to take out our Jesus, our Awoskini, our prayer rope. We can all begin praying, even on the way home tonight in the car. And I just wanted to show a few pictures. Father, you mentioned this out of the So this is the Cathedral of St. Gregory Paramas in Thessalonica. There's some icons on the wall, which I found especially mm -hmm. fascinating. So here's St. Gregory Palamas, and he's refuting Bar Long here. That's him. Here we have the enthronement of St. Gregory Palamas as the Archbishop of Thessaloniki. This is the council that I mentioned earlier in 1341, where we have... Um, St. Gregory Palamas and Bar Long, and they're kind of fighting it out over what's true in Orthodoxy. At the bottom it says, the Hesychast Synod, which was gathered in June of 1341 in Constantinople, in the Holy Church of St. So of Hagia Sophia, <laughs> with Andronikos, the Emperor, and with Ioannis Kalekas, the Patriarch. And finally, the reliquary of St. Gregory Palamas is off in this little side room. A very small chapel, actually. With a dome over him, you see him in the icon here. There's a little altar here. And this is his reliquary. So if you're ever blessed with the son of Yiki, certainly go and visit him, receive his blessing. And we pray that he will guide us in our prayer lives, not only during Lent, but throughout our lives, so that we can have Christ in our own lives. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for John? Did you say that uh, Marlam realized that he was wrong? Did you say that? Well, the way it went was after they had come, come out with the decision, after they said Marlam was wrong, they strongly recommended that he recant, that he kind of take back everything. <laughs> so right there on the spot he did kind of shook hands and went his separate way afterwards he kind of reconsidered and he was saying to himself well maybe I should you know I kind of want to fight this I feel like this was rigged I feel like they fixed this before we even got into the trial but he didn't pursue anything as we say and he went off so so we read the yeah, we don't really have a strong answer, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 13 something, it was the Roman Empire, it was before the, uh, the Muslims came. How they allowed that metropolis to be built and be the archbishop there? Ah, uh, you're referring to this church right here? Yeah, it's the southern mm -hmm. Right, so... Uh, Obviously, there was an Orthodox Church, like a presence of faithful in Thessaloniki at the time. Not that specific church. Now, there are churches in Thessaloniki that stretch way back to the Byzantine Empire. Not this specific one. This one was built, so oh, I don't know, 100 years ago. This one's not that. Oh, it was brand new. Right. Oh, it's this pretty is new. after the Ottomans. Yeah, yes. that was 19th century. Oh. Right. This particular church building is much newer. But there are there are churches in Thessaloniki, and the church has been the um, the Orthodox Church. Yeah, no, Saint Demetrius is a very old church. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a new one. This is a newer one, yes. And what are the relics? Um, they're in the church. Yeah, yeah, on the left. On the left. So when you walk in, it's like on the left. There's like a and chapel inside. Like, yes. I mean, you can just go and visit. Mm hmm. So Barlam had his followers in Italy, and then how he would communicate? No, well, actually, he had followers even in Thessaloniki. Oh, 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 oh. It was, you know, oh, oh. kind of a, I don't want to say, you know, but kind of a head-to-head, -head, like, it was all happening in one place. Constantinople, Thessaloniki, okay, so Athos, yeah. Um, 
John, I read somewhere that um, the Catholics, in some ways, they condemn our monasticism because of the, it, it all kind of originated with the followers of St. Catalan's and the type of breathing that they did in order to, to do the um, prayer, or the Jesus prayer. And um, they called it very, like, you know, just being saved by the yoga life and things. Is there any way that you thought you can address that? Bobby, do you have anything? No, it's just. I mean, and to what you've heard, there's been an attitude like that. You can look, you just have to look at the monastic rite of the Catholics, where they're very Franciscan, and other examples, and you hear them, whenever you see a monastery, a Catholic, you know, whether it's a nunnery, or where they have, you know, uh, male monks, they, um, they have their own style, they have their rite, and what they do, and obviously, I, many instances relate back to this story, with St. Gregory Palamas, because it really was the institution of hesychasm that strengthened Mount Athos at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it actually was the support during the Ottoman Empire that sustained Mount Athos and the monks, because, you know, Greece and all those lands were under Ottoman occupation for 400 years. How were they going to retain this, you know, any type of orthodoxy? And it was through simplistic prayer that was actually pretty much nonverbal or very much silent. So therefore, it was the opposite of usually what was going on with the Western, because they had the they had the liberty and the freedom, and the monks there were not in, enclosed into their monasteries. Well, too, they would walk freely, participate, and they would all practice, and they would kind of have their rights and what they would do. So it's actually, I think, just kind of, and the one thing that I think John also highlighted too, which is important, and someone asked, every heresy uh, that has always existed throughout all of you know Christianity. It wasn't ever located in one place. Like, it was spread out throughout Christendom. We're talking about from Aryan to you name it, even to Barlam. This wasn't just like one centralized, like, oh, let's just have an argument or whatever. This was a real problem across all of Christianity because they all fed off each other. And then you'd have divisions. One says this, one says this. So what I think it really does is, then going back to your point with monasticism, that was already a hot topic. And because everyone had such attitudes about each other, politics... Why would they agree with what the East is doing? We're going to do it the way we're doing it. And that's how they built their own rights and we'll go from there. It was almost done like on purpose at BP Desk so that they didn't m mirror what the East was doing in many instances. It's sadly how, how the fallen state of the division of Christianity really was amplified in that manner. So, yeah, that's the reality of where we're at now. So, anyone else? Any other questions? So, outside of monasticism, the Orthodox Church doesn't really do a great job of teaching the Jesus Prayer. And I've heard some go as far to say as, uh, you know, they're concerned about delusion and things like that. I just wondered your commentary or take on that. I, I'm going to disagree with your first statement that we don't do a good job of teaching the Jesus Prayer. Um, especially in recent years, um, it has come to the forefront of Orthodoxy. Um, especially with, like I mentioned, um, more and more kind of saints of that has a caste tradition, St. Joseph, uh, elder, um, St. Ephraim of um, there are other kind of elders who maybe are still on my office even to this day, who are very much in tune with this tradition and it's kind of taken roots in America. Um, beyond that, what was your question? I'm sorry. Oh, I was just wondering your take on that because I just don't think, uh, I think a like personal prayer life is, is uh, something I can use a lot more focus, and I think that would get a whole lot more, more, more at a lay level. Yeah. How do how do uh, the church does not educate at a lay level? A he's right. A good question. Personal prayer life. Uh, I don't know. If, I know. I could tell you on my point as a priest. Um, you know, I, I it's. I think both. You know, like his point makes one valid. Matt makes a point as well too. It's very difficult because, you know, there, there has to be one thing with, as being Orthodox Christian, and I've heard it from many church fathers, even when I talk to monastics, there must always be a divide of monasticism and cathedral rite. Do you know what cathedral rite is? That's your parish, parish home. Technically, you can't mesh the two 
because they're literally two different worlds. So monasticism, any monastic is called not of this world. That's why they go into a monastic life, and they are there to pray for us and to work in their manner outside of the world that we are in. And when you talk to many monastics, they actually are in awe of people in the world who are dedicated and try to have a prayer life into a ten church. Noting the intensity of work, family, A, B, C, D. So, but the problem is, um, I think as well too, I can't speak for John, but I think himself recognizes it as well, is it's very difficult to, um, to teach a prayer rule because there is, no, there is no standardization of prayer rule. You know, when you have hesychasm and you have what monastics teach, that's one example. Then you have another person who works 80 hours a week and then they don't know how to apply a type of prayer rule. Then you also have the barriers of language. Then you also have the barriers of uh, family, commitments, and stuff like that, where the only type of prayer is then supplicated through a Sunday worship, and then we become Sunday church folks. Where that's an evident issue of Greek Orthodox, because you know we offer Wednesday night, Monday night compline, but Friday night salutations, and the amounts are less compared to a, a filled church on Sunday. So there's a reality that people, I think, are not connecting to the general worship to then apply to a prayer life. So... To Matt's point, I think I think a prayer rule and a prayer life for an individual, lay person of the world, right, who works and has family, uh, I think it's high level Orthodox Christianity. We don't even know why we worship in the first place. So I think that's a simultaneous issue, both for worship and then prayer, depending on what's a necessity of someone. So now if someone worships and then is trying to figure out a prayer rule, that's another point where they're trying to enhance their connection, the relationship with God. So. I think it's a realistic issue. Uh, I, again, as you can hear from my verbiage, I don't have a solution. I don't know if there is one right now, but John, what would you want to add to it? If I could just add one thing. Um, it is important to have both personal prayer and communal prayer, though. You can't have one without the other. Um, you can't have Sundays without also doing your prayers at home, and you can't have your own personal Jesus at home, but then not want to step foot sure. in church. One supports the other, one empowers the other. So, Yeah, good point. Very good. Anyone else? No? Thank you, John. Now I stick on that. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Uh, we pray it was a beautiful night. Boy, Fiamas. We thank John again and the uh, Community of Ascension for, uh, for allowing to be with us. And God willing, we'll see you Friday for the second get if he's me, the second salutations at our community and all the communities. And then next week's Lenten lecture to follow as well. Kalita Saski, Kalisa Rakosti.